Blog Talk Radio. Warning, the following program may include profane language, controversial viewpoints, and perspectives on the true nature of reality so far removed from the status quo, they'll make your head spin like a top. Young children, corporate executives, and religious fundamentalists should turn away now. Konnichiwa, planet Earth. Welcome to Extraordinary Year. My name is Tim Bravo, and I thank you for joining us tonight. T minus 144 days until December 21st, 2012. Our guest tonight died of brain cancer in 1982. No, we're not doing another interview from the grave like we did with Michael Talbot, but we will be speaking with someone whose experience afforded him a perspective from which to explain the holographic nature of the universe. Melon Thomas Benedict is one of the most well-known near-death experiencers alive, and yes, he is alive, although to call him a near-death experiencer may not exactly be accurate because he actually did die and was dead. In fact, he not... Had he not interrupted what open minds have come to understand as the standard death experience, he may well have just moved on into the light, and we would be stuck talking about the election tonight like everyone else. But he did do something that interrupted the process. Because of that, he's here with us tonight to regale us with this most intricate exploration of the dying process and the true nature of humanity's existence, the true nature of our planet, the true nature of all creation. So detailed, in fact, that our beloved Deepak Chopra refers to him as an encyclopedia of the afterlife. Now, I've asked him onto the program tonight because in Mellon, we are blessed to have a brother who's seen not just the far reaches of the cosmos, but our own future. And he says that future is good. Over the course of this extraordinary year, 2012, I, my frequent co-host, Canada and Matt, our guests, and you, the listeners, have examined so many aspects, so many timelines, so many conspiracies, indications, positive and negative. Tonight, I want to explore Mellon's experiences with you in order to reignite our collective hope for tomorrow. Now, I dare guess that at the end of this show, we'll all be feeling a bit more positivity, a bit more hope. Mellon Thomas Benedict, thank you for joining us and helping to enlighten us at a time when many of us just might need it. Well, thanks, Tim. It's a, a pleasure to be on your show, and um, uh, I'm, I'm here to tell people there's a completely different uh, story going on in the world than they think is going on. Now, you you have a very intricate, multi-textured, detailed experience, you know, in this, this death experience of yours. Um, for the purpose of tonight, can you give us just sort of the bare bones overview of the experience from beginning to end real quickly? Yeah, I'll try to put it in a nutshell, so to speak. Um, basically, I'm someone who um, was um, uh, not even an atheist. I had no spirituality whatsoever. I think atheists at least show some interest. They'll argue with you about the subject of God and eternity and all that sort of thing, which I thought was uh, most of my life was a pointless exercise, like talking about politics. <laughs> yeah. But um, but for me, I, I'm someone that, um, uh, you know, just... Um, turned around one day and my whole life flipped upside down. I, I had been experiencing um, uh, blackouts and episodes like that. I went to a series of doctors and was diagnosed with a uh, terminal disease that was inoperable and curable at the time and totally unprepared for it. Uh, I don't know if you can be prepared uh, for a doctor telling you that you're terminal. In fact, um, uh, after the testing and the doctor came in to uh, talk to me, when he said the word terminal, it I did, just didn't even register with me. I, I said, well, what are you saying? You know, what do you mean? And so I was caught completely off guard, completely clueless. Before before my experience, I had uh, I was not in the metaphysics as, as people are today, anything like that. I wasn't interested. I, uh, I also had never heard of hospice till I ended up in one. So talking about being completely clueless, um, uh, there you go. I'm also someone who, although I didn't have a spiritual background, um, 
per se that I believed in. Of course, I've, I've been raised for a number of years in Catholic boarding school. That may have something to do with <laughs> my not believing in deities at the time. But um, for, for me, I was very much into ecology and science and everything. And, and going even back to the 60s, uh, 1960s, that is, in the past century, um, <laughs> the uh, experts of the time were telling us that uh, no matter what mankind did, uh, it was too late. We couldn't turn. We couldn't turn around our devastation to planet Earth. That we were going to overpopulate planet Earth. That we were going to blow the Earth up. I mean, all those things, you know, that people worry about. Well, I believed it, and uh, I believed all the experts. And you know, as, as history has shown us, both from prophecy and, and scientific experts, that they're they're quite often wrong. I mean, even Einstein was wrong about the uh, expanding universe. He was completely wrong about that. But uh, but I believe them. I believe the experts of our time. And for me, what happened was I saw a photograph, and, and, I, and, I, and I understood this after I, uh, in my near-death experience when I had a life review. I saw a photograph that gave me the seeds of my disease, and that was a photograph uh, collage that a group, had, uh, a well-meaning group, had put together of the city of Los Angeles from the air, an aerial photograph of the city of Los Angeles. And right next to it, it was comparing it to a micro photograph of a cancer cell, and they looked very similar, almost exact. Mm. And in that moment, in my heart of hearts, and I didn't realize it at the time, it took um, many years later uh, for me to actually understand it. At that moment, I had the thought in my heart of hearts that nature had gone wrong and created a malignant cancer on planet Earth called humanity. And... Uh, being a human and believing in my heart of hearts that humans were cancers on planet Earth, that the Earth had a cancer called humanity, <clears throat> guess what I developed? Uh, years later, I developed brain cancer. And uh, so uh, completely clueless. I was a self-employed artist at the time. No, uh, no health insurance. It's still an issue today, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I pretty much fell through the cracks of um, uh, after getting diagnosed and um, I was told it was inoperable and incurable, given six to eight months to live at the time. And I'm one of those people that literally fell through the cracks, and there are many of them uh, that actually get uh, these kind of diagnoses of serious medical conditions or terminal illnesses that walk away, and you never hear from them again. You don't know if they lived or died. You don't know. Well, I'm one of those. I'm one of the lost ones who fell through the crack to come back and tell you that um, I survived. I survived a terminal illness, and I survived death itself. Um, for me, uh, I succumbed to my. I believe I succumbed to my disease while in hospice care, and uh, had a had a living will, uh, asking not to be resuscitated uh, in any way whatsoever. In fact, I wanted them to leave my body alone for six hours to make sure I was dead because. I was someone who really believed the world was going to end in my lifetime, not from any religious prophecy or anything, just from what I was seeing on television, what I was believing from the newscast, and what I was believing from uh, these uh, well-meaning ecology groups, which were spreading a lot of disinformation at the time that I, I, I thought was the truth. So uh, basically, um, I, I, I had this thing that we call a near-death experience. I didn't even know that was what I had until... Um, uh, several years later, after my near-death experience, which took place in uh, 1982, I had met a woman named uh, P.M.H. Atwater, who is one of the leading researchers and writers in the field. I attended one of her lectures, and I, th I said to myself, I think that's kind of what happened to me. And so um, I, I got to know her after that lecture. I've been her friend ever since to this day, and she's the one that kind of discovered me in the backwaters of... Mm -hmm. uh, of the South where I lived, and she started introducing me to other people like Dr. Ken Ring and other researchers as an interesting case because she she had interviewed thousands of cases. Dr. Ken Ring had, had, had interviewed at least 10,000 cases near death by that time, and they thought there was something interesting about my case that I, I didn't know because I had nothing to compare it with. I knew no other near deathers. Um, I really didn't even uh, identify with the word. and. Um, in my case, they were surprised to find out that when I went to what people call the light, and there is a light, there is a light, and the, the light is the source of us all. It's the source where we all come from, we all go to, where we're all regenerated from. There is a source. 
And uh, when I found myself in front of that source, I was completely surprised. And like, I guess any good atheist, I wasn't even an atheist, so I guess any good non-believer, being very surprised, uh, asked the, just said, are you God? I, I thought I was standing before uh, my traditional uh, conceptions of what I'd learned in Catholic boarding school. And the, uh, uh, I, I realized almost immediately that I was having an interactive experience. And this is what the researchers kind of thought was interesting about my case is that I asked the light if we could talk. I wanted to, I had a lot of questions. And I'm the first near death that they know of that did this. I actually stopped the experience, had a great conversation with the source, the light, and uh, and also um, uh, had an expansion of consciousness in which I thought I was seeing because I was asking. I had a lot of questions to ask the light because if this is a, if this is the source and this is the one person that might be able to answer all your questions or the one or the one source that may be able to answer all questions. I had a lot of questions. So huh. as far as they know, I'm the only near deather that uh, believed and, and treated this as an interactive experience and actually had a great conversation with the light. Now, we all, when we all go to that light, and we all will, <clears throat> whether you have a near death experience or an actual death, um, we, we'll, we will all find ourselves in front of that source. And I, I have to tell you that that source light begins in your heart, in your heart of hearts. That's where the light begins. That's where that tunnel of light that they talk about begins. And it connects you with the source. You are always, always connected to that source, no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, no matter what you've done, no matter if you believe there is no source, no matter if you believe some voodoo doctor disconnected you from it, you can never be disconnected from the source. And that source knows you intimately. It will speak to you in whatever dogma you're stuck in, whatever religion you think you believe in, whatever your family upbringing, whatever your language. The source knows you. And so it will, if you, if you have a conversation with it, it will, it will speak to you in your language, so to speak. So, if you're Christian, it will give you a Christian experience. If you're Muslim, you will have a Muslim experience. If you're Jewish, you will have a Jewish experience, and, and on and on. I had no particular belief in anything, certainly any kind of religious deities. I certainly thought that was silly. But oddly enough for me, when I asked the light uh, these questions, um, are you God, um, the light, uh, the first thing I saw was, um, you know, Jesus, which was my earliest reckonings of what a deity might be. Mm -hmm. And as far as, uh, as far as the researchers know, I'm the only one that asked. I, I was seeing Jesus. I could feel the energy, the Christ energy, the Christ uh, complex. And it is real. The Christ energy, the Christ aspect in all of us is real. But I asked the light, what, it, what does this mean? Like, pull the curtain? I know I'm seeing this, but what does this really mean? And that's when uh, my conversation with the light took on a very interesting aspect in that every time the light showed me something, I asked to show me what that was, or what that was really about, what that was revealing. And it turned out um, to be a very, very interesting and uh, long conversation and uh, changed my life. Okay, um, and it was very, very intricate, very detailed, and multi-layered, and you ended up, you know, over the course of this thing, from from what I've read, and I've read a detailed, detailed account that, that you, have, you wrote personally, um, I mean, it, you went off to the end of the cosmos and back, basically, right? Yes, and that's not actually uh, very difficult to do. Any of us can do that. You don't have to die to do it. I, I, you know, um, I'm someone that had a life of uh, hard karma, and I used to do everything the hard way. I was thick as a brick. But uh, uh, this is not that difficult, actually. We all have the uh, capability. We're all equipped uh, to do this kind of uh, astral travel, so to speak. And uh, I did ask the, uh, once, once all of my personal questions, so I, I had a lot of personal questions. I had, uh, 
while I was in hospice, I'd read some books on world religions, or at least flipped through them to see if there was anything meaningful, you know, maybe boning up on the subject. Uh, um, but um, I, uh, once my personal questions were answered, I did ask the universe to show me the rest of the universe. Uh, I asked the light to show me the rest of the universe. And it seemed as though I was traveling, but I can tell you now what happens is you don't have to travel anywhere. Your consciousness expands. And mm-hmm. so you can be right at your home on your couch in your pajamas and explore the universe if you have the aptitude to. That would be something that I think a lot of listeners would like to do. Um, so I remember from what I've read of the account that uh, towards the end, you asked to be able to remember this and and were given a an affirmation, a yes. And and didn't immediately remember everything because you were kind of in shock when you, when you came back. But um, within days, you basically had the whole account. How much of the experience do you reckon you you have remembered? And and you know, have you lost any? Do you think? No, I've never uh, I've never lost one second of it. I asked for that blessing and I received it. Now that blessing can also have a little bit of a curse to it too. Never being able to forget anything, uh, so you have yeah. to deal with that part also. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, stopping this process mid dying. Would you recommend people follow your example and stop and ask the light questions? Absolutely. I think um, uh, it's a, I know it's a completely interactive experience. You know, just as the life you're living right now in your body is a completely interactive experience, I have to tell you that so is the death experience or the near-death experience is a completely interactive experience. I, 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 I encourage everyone to stop and have a conversation with the life before you begin your next incarnation. And um, I, I, I have a funny note to that. I've had a couple of surgeries in the 30 years uh, since uh, my near-death experience, and both times that they put me under, I, I asked uh, with the staff there and the, and the anesthesiologist about to put me under. I said, "Now hold on, guys. If I if I have a near-death experience, don't pull me back too quick. Let me enjoy it a little bit first. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so it sounds like. Be, you know, before your your death experience, you ha- you you have you had a view of humanity and maybe even the earth as doomed. Uh, a view many folks today might resonate with, but you brought back a different view from your experience, and that carries through to today. Have we? Uh, I mean, is, is your message to to people who look around and and see the environmental destruction and devastation and the you know the corporate grip caring more for profits than for you know what happens tomorrow? Do you do you see us as already having been saved based on what you saw? We're already saved. Uh-huh. Absolutely. What what we have to what us common folk, us regular folk, have to realize is that there is something called the illusion, or as uh, in India they call it the Maya, the illusion, uh, which is perpetuated by not only our families and our stories we tell each other, but by the media and by history books. There is a great illusion as to what history is and to what we've been through. You know, people have been complaining about taxes for uh, 5,000 years, you know? (laughs) People have been complaining about their rulers for as long as man can remember. Um, But I can tell you this, things have gotten so much better for the general world situation. And um, in my my, uh, workshops and in my uh, seminars, I spend a lot of time pointing this out to people things that you can check out yourself because my relationship with the light has been one of a practical application of what you might call higher consciousness, not philosophy. I'm someone that uh, goes to the light every day, and that's another thing the researchers found that was unique about me. I don't know why to this day that all near-deathers don't go back to the light at will and get information. Um, I don't. I can't understand that. But I've been able to go back to the light and do every day since my near-death experience. In fact, um, I developed into a talent where I can do it in think tanks. I can do it in double-blind studies. My relationship has been one of answers that can be 
tested, patented, built, and experimented with. Um, and so um, when um, uh, I encourage people to look at this in a different way now, and the, the interesting thing about the world is that um, we, we have a very short memory, and uh, especially our education system doesn't really teach us much about history. I'm someone that everything the light has ever told me, I've checked it out. Um, I've, I've uh, bird dogged it down. I've researched it. And I've been blessed ever since my near-death experience to be a full-time researcher in, the, in this field. And so I have the time and I also have the great interest in bird dogging down uh, uh, all these mysteries and all these misconceptions that we might have. And what I've discovered in 30-some years of the light guiding me to look into things is that uh, right now, as we're talking right this minute, things are 95% better for the general population of the planet than they've ever been before in history, including the number of wars, including the number of illnesses, including everything you can think of. We can go right down the list and show you how they've significantly improved, especially since about 1955. We are really taking off into a new kind of world now, but we still have to deal with the old problems. The oldest problem is mankind and every tribe and every empire and every citizen has ever had to deal with are mainly kings, priests, and thieves. They're always the constant problem. So who are our modern kings, priests, and thieves? You know, I would say Wall Street for one, right? Yeah, well, uh, we would agree with you on this show. You know, and so um, uh, uh, so this is a this is a this is not anything new. But but what people don't understand is because they you know most people work very very hard. They go home and they just want to relax, and I understand that. But I'm 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 someone that can lead you to the information that you can check out yourself and find out that the world is really um, at the highest IQ level it's ever been at in history. Generally speaking, we have the highest IQ the planet's ever known. You know, the average child born today has more information at their fingertips than Einstein could even imagine. Isn't that interesting? Mm. More people have access to water, more people, clean water. More people, there are more therapists, more scientists, more healers, more doctors, more everything on this, more problem solvers on this planet than ever before in history right at this moment. And yet, um, and yet for some reason, and I call it the Maya, the, the illusion that we're getting from media, because, you know, media only believes in, in you know, the, the, old, the old axiom, if it doesn't believe, it doesn't read. And they, they never report all the goodness. Every day of our lives, there's more good, infinitely more good going on in the world than uh, negativity. Now, there are some people out there that will never see all the good in the world, and I'm not trying to convince anybody and convert anybody, and I, I certainly wouldn't try to convince um, someone who believes there's no good in the world. That's, that's not my job. But I can tell you, generally speaking, um, and I prove this in my, my DVDs and, and in the work that I do, things that you can check out yourself is that the, the crime rate is the lowest in history. The homicide rate is lowest in history. Did you know that? Per capita, I'm assuming. In, in civilized countries, say from China to Europe, they have been measuring serious crimes since at least 1200s. And your chance of, of being harmed and robbed and murdered uh, go up infinitely as you go back in time. They go down to the smallest it's been in history. And when people think we're, we're uh, you know, we're, we're such a, a, a negative uh, species, one of the first questions that I asked the light in my, in my initial conversation with the light was, um, you know, one of the very first questions I asked the light was, can you tell me why humanity is so dark and doomed and evil? Why? Why? And at that moment, the light uh, took me into what we would call a mandala. And for people that don't, under, don't understand what a mandala is, it's sort of like one of those um, round, giant uh, window, stained glass windows in a, in a cathedral. It was, I was taken into a mandala that was alive and living. And I call this the mandala of human souls. And... I was put into the center of this mandala, this matrix of human souls, and it, was, it seemed as if 
I could look into every human soul, including my own, and I could see no darkness at our core essence. I could see no evil. There's not one human that's ever lived or living today that in their core of core, their essence is not pure. And that is the saving grace of this planet. And when I saw that, because I'm someone who died believing humanity were a malignant cancer on planet Earth, I, I had the worst thoughts of humanity. And when I saw this and, and the light showed me in, in the, into what a soul looks like, I... That's what transformed me. I believe that's the moment I got healed. And as I was actually understanding this, and it still gets me to this day, as I was getting it, the light said to me, Oh, beautiful human. And we, and I know that we are loved. We are loved by this planet. We are loved by the source we are loved and we are graceful beings in our essence. And our essence will win out over all. And our essence has been, in, it has been winning out over all through all of history. No matter what king, priests, and thieves have thrown at us, we, the common people, have transcended that. And we will continue to transcend this for a beautiful future that's just around the corner. Well, and, and you know, I... I I want to ask you a, a lot of questions from the detailed accounts that I've read, but in the accounts that I've read, uh, I know that you've you've gotten a view of times just ahead, and I know you've gotten a view of our future up to 400 years from now, and I, I didn't find anything along those lines. And so let me ask you now, because um, that's kind of one of the main things I wanted to bring out tonight is what – from your experience, what do we have laying just ahead of us? Can you can you give us a description? Can you bring us some hope? Yes, and it's like you can't see the forest for the trees. Although um, the companies that run supercomputers and you know the, the people on top are not stupid people. Um, some of them may not have ethics, but they're not stupid. People. Many of them are actually very good people running some of the top corporations in the world. And I know that may shock some people to even hear that, but it's true. Uh, the world is filled with mostly good people. Um, what, what, is, what is about to happen is something that's never happened before on planet Earth and never could have happened before in any other time in history before now. Did you know that since 1975, we have been at a technical point, and this is what's important to understand, a technical point. That means technically means it can be done now. It's not a philosophy. It's not a wish. It's not a dream. Since 1975, the world has been at a collective intelligence level and a collective level of, of, um, of mastery that we can clothe, feed, comfort every human on planet Earth without damaging the planet. That has never been accomplished before in the history of the world. And this sets up a completely different future because as shocking as it may sound, as unbelievable as it may sound to some of the listeners out there, that many, 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 many people, heads of corporations, uh, heads of uh, powerful people are actually very good people. Uh, many of us don't see that because we don't get to know these people. We don't look into it. There are so much goodness going on from top to bottom. And here's what's important. What's about to happen is not so much a spiritual uh, evolution or revolution. The next greatest step humanity will take together, which is the most important step in history, we are taking now, and we've been taking the step since 1975, and that is transcending survival for the whole planet. Because from the beginning of our time on planet Earth, from, this, from the first life on planet Earth, from the bacteria and microbes, to the human beings of today, we have been caught up in nothing but a survival mode of existence. Dog eat dog, um, pay your rent, get a job, all of this has been so stressful. And we have, we've now accomplished a level which I believe the highest people on the planet know this. They know it from their estimations. They know it from the supercomputers. The Dalai Lama knows it. The Pope knows it. Nobody wants to talk about what's next. And that is 
and don't let this don't let this make you be afraid. Don't let this give you fear. There will never again in the history of the world be as many jobs as there was once before. The industrial revolution is over. You know, and here's how I'll put it in a metaphor for you. Did you know what really freed the slaves back when the when the days of slavery and slavery of course went on for five thousand or more years, probably longer than that. What ended slavery? It wasn't so so much the do-gooders. That was good. The abolitionists. That was all well-meaning. But what really freed the slaves was something much more practical. Up until the Industrial Revolution, the the only way you could be really rich was to have a lot of slaves, servants, or serfs. In 1807, when the Industrial Revolution began in England, suddenly you could become very wealthy without having slaves. Very important to understand. The machines freed the slaves, okay? Now, what's happened is we have become industrial animals. We are part of the Industrial Revolution. And we're at a time in history now through artificial intelligence, robotics, and all of that, where you don't even need the middle class to be rich anymore, do you? No. And what's happened? The people on top are doing just what the just what the first industrialists did in 1807. They got rid of they just let the slaves go and make their own life. We are being let loose to make our own lives now. There will be a new society of which we are forming now. A new society not based on consumerism and being a consumer and a producer. That time is over. We have technically accomplished enough to set mankind free now. It's never happened before in history. The the step that will that will enable that, we're technically there, we can do it. The future is not about jobs, it's about a completely different kind of society. Um and our children are moving into that society. You know, most of our children now are not, uh, a lot of parents, I hear a lot of parents say, my children don't seem to be interested in working. Well, there's a good reason. Um, life is not about work in the future. Uh, your children are prototype human beings of a new non-industrial society that will be forming within the next couple of incarnations that we have. Um, what's happening is that we are forming a new world now. We are slaves. Those of us of the Industrial Revolution are slaves to our jobs, slaves to bosses, slaves to jobs we think are are, are, are uh uh, dead ends, slaves to jobs we think are meaningless. Well, take take this in the heart, and, and I know it's terrible if you've lost your job. I've been almost homeless three times in my life. I know what that's like. Um, but take in the heart that the world is moving on, and the new world that's coming is not anything like the industrialists imagine. It's not anything like the politicians imagine, although they have inklings of it. Nobody wants to talk about this. But the new world is one in which You can imagine a life where work is not the essence of your work. Right now, if you don't have a job, you're not worth anything, are you? Well, they they definitely tell the occupiers to go get a job. I know that from standing out on the corner. Do you think the the worth and magnificence of a human being is based on how much money they earn? Give me a break. That is not what a human being is worth. A human being is worth infinitely more than what you might think a job or an income is. And in the future, near future, by the way, this is recognized. Because um, just as the industrialists uh, uh, let the slaves go to find their own lives, and they did, the middle class is being let go now to go find their own lives. And the middle class will recreate a new world, just like the, uh, the common man. Oh. Melon, I don't know if you can hear us, but I think uh, I think we are you out there, buddy? Oh, that's a bummer. Melon, we lost your signal. We're just getting static. Well, I wonder if you can hear us. Well, Melon, Hello. Melon, are you back? There he is. I yeah, we, uh, well, I don't know what, was, what was the last thing you heard? <laughs> well, static. Um, <laughs> no, I. Uh, I don't recall you were you were uh, you were talking about the middle class being let you know set free to make a new world for themselves. Yeah, I, we we probably have a bad connection here. Should I call on another line? 
Well, I mean, it sounds great now, and with the exception of just those few awkward seconds there, I think we're okay. okay. Oh, good, good. Well, when, what I saw and what the light has shown me is that the future is quite different than the present, just as the present is very different than uh, 200 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Things no. keep changing. And um, we're living in a most graceful time, actually, and... All right, you still there? Dang. I apologize to listeners. We are going to get this squared away as straight as possible. Step for humanity there. and for all of us is self-initiation. Melon, we did actually have you drop out again. Is there a landline local that you might be able to uh, call in through? Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, disconnect and call you right back another line. Okay, okay. We'll be here waiting for you. Okay, good. Hold on. Okay. I hope that viewers are enjoying the topic of conversation tonight. And and I'm not sure how all of this plays in with uh, the Ascension topic that we like to talk about on this show. But I really feel, you know, that Mellon is somebody, I mean, he had an authentic experience. And, and this is something that um, he's been living with and talking about for, like he says, 30-some years. Well, I guess it's just at 30 years. And for him to have seen these things then, to me, speaks volumes to the authenticity and, and just really encourages me as a human being um, living through these times. Oh, here we are. And it looks like we've got him. There we are. Yeah. Yeah, I've never had a problem like this, but, uh, you know, it must be Election Day or something. A lot of static out there. <laughs> there, there has been quite a, uh, quite a few interesting problems with the Internet for myself today. So, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, near future, um, it's really looking kind of bright for us. Uh, well, did you yeah, have well, specific vision um, or, I mean... You just kind of saw an overview of how man would be living in the near future. And when we say near future, what kind of time period are we talking about? Well, well you know, uh, we really have to think in cosmic time um, because um, uh, these things uh, these things happen in a cosmic time frame, not in a human, um, you know, mechanical time frame. <laughs> so we're looking at within the next one or two incarnations a completely different world. We're looking at by 2100 being a completely different world. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So to throw it to the far-flung future, I guess relatively far-flung for those of us who are alive today, um, but I know it's been said that you saw up to about 400 years from now. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, when I asked uh, the light uh, if I could see the future, the light explained to me that uh, why most prophets are never accurate and predictions are never accurate is that you can never actually predict an exact time or minute that things will happen. What you can predict is karma and the karma of time and events. The, uh, and karma only means cause and effect. You know, when, uh, you, if, if there's a certain karma going, you can almost predict where it's going to go. You know, like if you're drunk driving a car, you can almost predict something's bound to happen. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, and so this is why uh, most prophets have never been very accurate. In fact, you know, in the ancient times, if a, if a prophecy didn't come true very quickly, they were killed. In almost every culture, from the Kahunas to the Pygmies to uh, to the uh, the time of uh, Christ and whatever, um, so uh, we let our modern day prophets just get away with crazy stuff because they're you know uh, uh, actually documented prophecies coming true is very 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 rare and uh, you know you get one right you make a career out of it. So here's what I saw: we can see the mass potential of our karma. And uh, or our, or the potential of what we're doing today, where it will lead to tomorrow, and what most people are doing is they're they're looking at the world. In fact, they're looking at their own lives, but they're looking at the world and world events uh, through a very narrow perspective. Uh, imagine this: you're you're looking at a beautiful painting, but you're only seeing it one inch at a time. And depending on what part of that painting you're looking at one inch of a time, some parts of it may look um, undescribable, other parts may look like hell, some parts may look like heaven, and it just goes on and on. 
but when you when you get a whole systems perspective, then all of a sudden the whole picture, the whole Earth, the whole history of Earth makes sense, and you kind of see where it's going. Uh, uh, the 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 mass potential, the karma of this planet and humanity has been steady from day one on this planet. I'm talking from day one of evolution on this planet. I'll give you an example, and then we'll get right into the, the into that kind of a future, just so people understand where I'm coming from. <clears throat> from day one on this planet, the universe has thrown everything at us it can. You know, there have been mass extinctions. There, 650 million years ago, the Earth froze completely over. All life died on planet Earth except DC, uh, deep sea green algae. The volcanoes of the Earth regenerated the Earth, and all life came back. And in fact, that green algae, that spirulina-type algae, is still in you today. It's in part of your DNA. It's still alive. So our, uh, what I'm trying to show is these patterns, and the long-term patterns are the only patterns that are really important. Um, so the universe has thrown everything at us it can. Heavy bombardments, uh, extinction of the dinosaurs, constant extinctions. And the only pattern that comes out of that is transcendence. Whatever the universe has thrown at us, we have transcended. That's our true pattern, is transcendence, no matter what comes. Whether it be cosmic disaster, whether it be uh, kings, priests, and thieves who are a constant pain in our sides. But uh, so when uh, today what people have to understand is, you know, um, uh, and I'll get to the future in a second, but I want people to understand this, is that, you know, you'll see on the news, worst, worst storm in recorded history, right? Sandy? Yeah, well, you look back, and they've only been recording these storms since 1970. You right. see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That's nothing. That's nothing in cosmic time. So everybody thinks the sky is falling. And, and even the most deep scientific scientific information really only goes back to uh, 1800s, 1900s. You know, in 1915, when Albert Einstein came up with the theory of relativity, there was only one thing known for sure about the universe, the cosmology. Do you know what that is? No. The sky is dark at night. <laughs> That and, and Einstein came up with all these brilliant theories when we knew almost nothing, uh, nothing for sure about the universe. And by the way, having a dark sky at night, Einstein ignored when he invented Lambda, you know, his uh, special theory, because he believed the universe was not expanding. But it was proved by Hubble it is expanding. If a universe is not expanding then where does all the light in the universe go from all the stars? It stays here. The night sky would be as bright as daytime. Einstein ignored this. Great guy, came up with a lot of great stuff. But you can mm. see how we, how, we have, uh, how we have grown and grown and grown. And so uh, since the 1990s, we know more about our bodies, our self, our oceans, our universe, and, and all of history put together. It's an amazing golden period of consciousness. Um, so what I saw as coming is this, is this potential, this uh, mass potential, this mass pattern that we have of transcendence. And we... What I have to tell people is, no, uh, and I'm a good steward, I'm a recycler, I'm an ecologist, I, I've been into that since the 60s, but what I have to tell people is no matter what we do, the planet will die someday. No planet lives forever, no star lives forever. Our manifest destiny, our, our destiny is a star seed destiny. We will start colonizing other planets um, in the next 400 years or so. Uh -huh. And uh, this pulls the Earth together in an incredible way, in so many ways. You know, we're spotting new planets every day, like Earth. We're looking for planets like Earth, because what point is it to look for life that we can't even recognize? We're first looking for life like us that we can recognize. And we're discovering planets uh, similar to ours in the Goldilocks range of temperatures and distance from the star and whatever, we are already well on the way to the stars. And so um, our, uh, and, and 
we are going to see technologies like replication technologies on Star Trek. They're already they're already begun. Do you know they're already starting to do that stuff now in laboratories? Teleportation already starting to do it in laboratories. Everything that we manifest in our imagination, we can manifest in reality. And uh, there's a good side and a dark side to that. The good side of it is, is that the future is without lack. In other words, no one has to work in the future. There's no need for, um, uh, w- there's no shortage of any, anything that we need in the future. Of course, it won't be a future where gold and diamonds are the primary thing. When you can replicate uh, through replication technologies, food, water, anything you want, gold and diamonds and that kind of wealth are become completely meaningless. They go back to what they were originally, decorative ceremonial items. Well, not to mention compensation, Mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When when you have a and we're in a super abundant society already, you know the the average income on planet Earth has gone up dramatically since 1955. Now, America and forgive me for saying this if I rub anybody the wrong way, but America has dominated, especially since World War One, has dominated the planet's resources, and Americans have been living in this bubble that is about mm-hmm. is really based on domination of of everyone else on the planet, resources and everything. That is breaking up now. No matter how much money we spend on the military, we cannot control the world anymore. Because the world, the future, and the world now is about being smart. It's not about being strong and blowing up people. I mean, we couldn't even win in Vietnam. We have to be smart now. Uh, That's why we don't ever have to worry about the Chinese. They're not going to fight us that way. They're going to fight us with smartness if they have to. So we have to get smarter, and as we get smarter, lack disappears, uh, abundance grows, and uh, as we move out of a total uh, society based on consumerism um, and all the pollution and all the effects that that causes, we move into a world that is far less polluted now, <clears throat> now in fact, than it will be in... Uh, the world right now is less polluted than it was back in the 1800s. Check it out. And we are continuing to um, um, become better and better at this. By 2100, there's going to be no pollution problem at all on planet Earth. And that's not, I'm not even, that's not even philosophy. That's things you can check out that are going on right now. So we, have, we move into a very different world. And what's interesting is if, if a culture, no matter what planet they are in the universe, if a culture achieves a level where they transcend survival first, you have to transcend that, where you don't have to kill people for food and, and land, um, once, you trans- once you get to the point where you can transcend time and space, because, you know, if you're going to go to other planets, you're going to colonize other planets, even if you're going to visit another planet, the speed of light is too slow for anything. It would take you 100,000 years even to go across our own galaxy. So imagine that if you are capable of visiting other planets, colonizing other planets, you have... You have reached a point of transcending time and space, and along the way, you've transcended survival. You've transcended having to fight anybody, manipulate anybody, rob anybody, or steal from anybody. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, And so... um, as as this uh, as this opens up to us, whole new vistas called over the horizon technologies appear out of nowhere. You know, most of the great things on planet Earth have never been predicted by any prophet or any futurist. You know, no one ever predicted the internet, did they? I suppose not. Not that no, I know. No, they didn't. And Bill Gates missed it completely. He was one of the last to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> so you you look at some of the greatest things that have happened on the planet. It's called over the horizon, just around the corner. There are things, and this has been this is also the 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 can, the um, pattern you can count on with uh, planet Earth and humanity is that we have faced many great uh, trials in our evolution, and and. Every time we get into these situations, something appears out of nowhere to solve the problem. People didn't know how to cure uh, illnesses. People didn't know uh, so many things that suddenly appeared out of nowhere, from medicine to technologies to new ways of farming. You know, the, the old way of farming, which is plowing up the ground and wasting tons of water, is over. We're, we're going into... We're going into ultra forms of hydroponics now, 
and the future. Imagine, <clears throat> and check this out. Go on the internet and look up Sky Farms. I'm a member of I'm a member of the Sky Farm community. You know, we since uh, since the '80s, we completely overbuilt the new buildings in our cities. How many buildings you see that are empty now? Everywhere well, you go, it depends every, on where you are. Well, uh, Gary, not, Indiana has probably got more than a few places. <laughs> well, I live near San Jose, California, and there are so many empty skyscrapers, it's amazing. Um, imagine hydroponics and farming going up, not spreading out across fields. The future is about local urban farming, and you can grow more food than you can imagine. Imagine these skyscrapers uh, being farms and every floor being climate controlled to whatever you want to have in your community. Uh, pollution is down. The only byproduct is mulch and oxygen. Check out Sky Farms on the Internet. This is one of those over-horizon things that most people don't even see that's already happening. It's a completely different way of making more than enough food for the whole planet. Excellent. Cool. Cool, yeah. And there's obviously quite a bit of stuff there if you go and check it out online, as I just did. Mm -hmm. Posting something to the Facebook page as we speak. (laughs) <laughs> so, Melanie, you really seem to, you, you paint a, a, not just a, a beautific and, and encouraging, inspiring picture of our future, but well, one that's actually kind of logical, if you, if you look at it, um, as the, the only p- piece of the puzzle that's really missing is the will. Because, like you said, we have the ability, um, and we know that there are technologies existent that are being suppressed, that aren't being talked about, aren't being acknowledged, that could change um, our travel, they could change, you know, they eliminate pollution, the need for pollution, the, the need for the energy grid, etc. Um, and if we just had the technologies we know we have, that it would just change everybody's life on this planet dramatically, um, especially in the way of reducing inequality um, and, and the need the lack, you know, just reducing that to bring everybody's, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. Well, and, and also you have to understand that as the middle class is losing out on this big time, um, the middle class now has to become self-initiated. We can't depend on giant corporations. We can't depend on governments that are too big. Self-initiation is the next step for us. Uh, it's something that no one else can do for you. It's called self-government. You know, a truly enlightened person isn't someone that can kiss the face of God or has the greatest guru. A truly enlightened person is someone that doesn't need a sign that says, uh, don't pollute. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Self-initiation, which is the the precursor to a self-government, is when um, we know we have to hold our leaders accountable. I mean, we never hold our leaders accountable for the things that they promise us. And um, forgive me for saying this, it might rub some people wrong, but we pretty much have the leaders we deserve. Um, We have to become, if you really want freedom uh, uh, and wisdom, uh, you have to actually do something about it. The, the, uh, the biggest complainers I know and have ever met are people that do nothing. They don't vote. They don't do anything. They don't participate in the PTA. They don't get involved in anything, but they're the biggest complainers. And they're the ones that are doing nothing. Um, but um, just in your phone book, in the first few pages of your phone book, is everybody you need to call. And I, I encourage people when I'm on radio shows to look up who your local leaders are, because your local leaders actually have more influence over you than uh, Washington, D.C. Check it out. They have more power over you. But uh, you, it's easy to get a list of everybody that has any influence on your life from local levels all the way to Washington. And if if we would just do what I call the pajama revolution. You just get up in the morning in your pajamas, fax, email, or call all of these leaders about once a week, something would start happening. How many people do that? I, when I'm doing my workshops, I ask people to raise hands, and hardly anybody's doing any of that at all. And I said, how about once a month? A few hands. How about once a year? Maybe once a year. But if you, if you just use the technology that you have and the consciousness that you have, uh, this world is going to change faster and faster, but it's self-initiation. Uh, what are you looking for? If you want a government that can take care of everything, what are you talking about? 
what I mean? Um, there's there's plenty of abundance. It's just being sapped by the ultra rich, as we know. We all know that's true, yep. and it's been that way all through history. By the way, isn't it time we came we became free of kings, priests, and thieves? Amen. Um, and that's self initiation. That's one of the biggest steps humanity will ever take. And so, uh, but I've got good news for you on that level. There. Um, so many hopeless people I meet are people that aren't even looking. They, they aren't, all they're doing is complaining. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that whatever problem you think there is, from a desert lizard to uh, sky farms to food to air, there are tens of thousands, if not millions, of bright people working on this now. Why don't you join them? Why don't you do something about it? Um, and uh, this kind of uh, world that's coming is is about participating more in your world, not less. How many people even know their neighbors anymore? You know, yeah. We we have to become a uh, this kind of connected community, which the internet and all this is is helping us with immensely, like never before in history. So the future is about more connectedness. It's about a global family. And these are not just words. This most people are living it, whether they know it or not. But I have good news for you. All those of you that don't have the energy, don't have the time, don't have the inclination to do anything about helping this world, don't worry about it. Don't feel guilty. This is not about making you feel guilty. You don't have to do anything because you know what? Tens of thousands, if not millions of us, have got you covered. <laughs> it's well underway. Believe me. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And, and it's, it's, it's speeding up. The time is speeding up because as the middle class lose more and more jobs, they're going to become more and more activated. Yeah. And there's plenty of abundance. It's amazing that we're still in an era where somebody needs to have $100 billion. Why? What's that about? Locked up in a bank somewhere. You know, what's that about? It's not helping anything, is it? Well, and as we continue to vote for leaders who promise us hope and change, and then, you know, those same leaders continue to not deliver, eventually people are going to realize that what we're doing isn't working, and we're going to, well, you know, people will get involved and, and, and make the change for themselves. Absolutely. We must hold our leaders accountable, all of them. Uh, from our local to our national. It's the only way, you know, uh, the only way to keep these people straight is to keep them straight. Don't expect them to do it on their own. And God I, forbid I, I, we have some, you know, <laughs> integrity in the people that we elect. Well, there's a lot, of, you know, actually there's a lot of good people in government, a lot of good people in industry and corporations. It's just that uh, the greedy always tend, these are, the, these are the kings, priests, and thieves. They always tend to muck up the problem. And, you know, you've heard this axiom before, but it's quite true. There's not that much evil in the world. It's just that good people do very little about it. Yeah. That's yeah. the karma. That's the karma of it, you see. Well, you but, know, Melon, I, I asked you on the show for an hour tonight, and we're right about at that point. I have a lot of other questions I wanted to ask you specifically about your extended death experience. Um, would, would you be open to hanging out for another half hour or so? Sure, yeah. yeah I can do okay. that. Um, might I uh, move into some of those real quick? Because I, I'm, there, there's so many interesting things that, and from the spiritual standpoint, from the the nature of reality standpoint that we like to explore on this show, you have insights that I think uh, would be valuable to listeners. Sure. So one of the things that you mentioned was seeing the Earth as a giant organism, and you kind of just spoke to that uh, with us all coming together um, and, and unifying and such, but you saw the Earth as a as sort of a kind of giant organism. Can you describe what that was like? Yeah, that was one of the greatest lessons I have learned with all my visitations with the light. Uh, um, and I'll give you a simple metaphor. When, when the first astronauts on their way to the moon took that first picture of the whole Earth, it changed them. Remember that? Yeah. The, the first picture of the whole Earth, when they looked at the Earth, they didn't see 
religions, they didn't see countries, they didn't see races, they didn't see skin color. They saw one living being, and it changed them. And I call this the Gaia perspective, because that's, um, when I asked the light, how can I most understand everything, it, the light said you have to look at this whole system. Human beings are rather chauvinistic in a way that we think we're the center of everything. And really, we are just one part of a greater living system. The ancients kind of knew this in metaphor and legend, uh, the web of life, all that is true. It's just that um, uh, uh, we have always thought of ourselves as special and different from every other form of life. We are a part of this earth as 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 uh, any other part of this earth. The entire earth is evolving as a consciousness. We are the human part of this earth, and we're the part of this earth that will transcend survival. No other part of earth will ever do that. This is our part of our evolutionary blessing, is we will transcend survival. Bacteria never will. Uh, the deer in the forest never will. Uh, we will transcend this and make the world a garden. Um, and uh, call it heaven on earth or whatever you uh, uh, choose to use. Um, but looking at the whole earth and the whole living system, then you have to understand one other thing. There's only one of us here. There's only one uh -huh. life here. Uh -huh. we're, we're all a part of this life. And so to let any other human starve or suffer is like letting a part of you suffer. It's like letting your foot rot off once you, once you understand this. And um, uh, so um, there's plenty of abundance here. There's, there's plenty of room for everybody in every life form. I, I said, uh, right, uh, the light told me this, and, and I, I started saying this back in 82, right after my uh, near-death experiences, that human beings would never overpopulate the earth. It would be impossible for us to overpopulate the earth, and that is, that is turning out to be the case. We're hitting zero population growth all over planet earth right now. And uh, by 2100, we will be at a much lower population than we are now without UFOs, without comets hitting the planet, without conspiracies, you know, <laughs> without any of that. It's just nature balancing itself. Uh, and um, so um, as, um, as this whole living system, we are the part. This living system is beyond intelligence. Uh, intelligence is only like one band of the rainbow, and so is spirituality. Spirituality is only one band of the rainbow. So if you see everything as spirituality, you're going to miss most of it. And if you see everything as just physical, you're going to miss most of it. If you see everything in science, you're going to miss because there's a lot of things in the universe that science will never be able to explain. It's beyond and what we call intelligence. So there is a knowing about life itself, of which we are directly a part of. We are life itself. And there's a something about life that knows it wants to go on, it wants to evolve. And this is why um, the Earth has evolved human beings. Human beings can build technologies to spot other planets, and to spot other, other homes to go to. So human beings are a very important part of our of this planet's evolution, and we're almost like Noah's Ark. We will be taking life with us everywhere we go when the time comes. Uh, but um, uh, as as far as as us, we we constantly in many modern religions have separated us from nature. You know, we're special. Uh, we're going to go to some heaven somewhere. When really, when you look at the reality of what's going on, we're already in heaven. You know, the, the concept of heaven and hell is rather a new concept in human consciousness. You know, hell isn't even in the Old Testament. Right. Um, so, it was, so this life we're living is our heaven or our hell. This planet is our heaven or our hell. What do you want it to be? It can be anything we want it to be. Um, if, if humans destroyed ourselves, we wouldn't destroy the planet because the planet has regenerated from everything the universe can throw at it. If we destroyed ourselves, the planet would go on. The planet would come up with something new, uh, very similar to us in the end, probably. But uh, we are blessed, and uh, this is why um, when you really get the, the sacredness of life, you want to cherish it, you want to preserve it, and you want it to thrive. Now, you saw uh, this light as being 
uh, not just your higher self, but all of our higher selves. Like you say, there's just one of us here in a, a matrix of our higher selves. And that, that from what I read, it sounds like that matrix of our higher selves was connected to and through this planetary grid that you were seeing. That's it's it's cool true. Our, our, uh, yes, our, 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 uh, our local, uh, this, this uh, earth represents a local uh, matrix for us. Um, and as we evolve, um, we start tapping into what's called universal consciousness and other types of consciousness as we evolve. But this is our local matrix. This is our, the earth is our cosmic body, so to speak. And um, there's really only one of us here. There's only one life on planet Earth. Step off the planet and look at it. You can see it. It's amazing if you understand the significance of those kind of photographs. Um, and uh, so once once you start seeing this, you you really start understanding what do unto others as you would have them do unto you really means. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. What heaven on earth really can mean. Um, and it, it transcends intelligence, and it transcends our temporal notions of spirituality. Well, it makes perfect sense that if you give everyone what you want for yourself, then everyone is good. You don't need Ten Commandments. That one alone will, will suffice very well. Uh, I wanted to, you had mentioned the, the mandala that you saw, the mandala of human souls. Um, as, as an artist, have you ever tried to recreate what you saw there with that middle? Well, I, I never could as as uh, as an artist or a painter, but um, uh, through uh, through computers and through uh, supercomputers and those kind of graphics, I have been able to come close to what that may look like. And and is there where the people can access that and see what you've done with that? Um, well, you know, I'm, um, I have some of that in my, I, I'm just releasing now a, a DVD seminar called The Spirit of Gaia, which is the greatest lessons I've learned in a, in a, in a video, which they can get on my website. And I have some of those images in that to show people Excellent. and I talk about it. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Actually, I have posted on our Facebook page a link to the product section of the website with your CD DVD set, um, and people would people should go check that out. Um, it, I was speaking with you earlier this afternoon. It is a wonderful opportunity for people to get out to one of the Mellon's seminars. Um, you know, the, whether it's airfare or you know, whatever. It, the, the price point is just incredible for the information that you're going to be getting. Uh, so definitely go check that out. And, uh, we've made it easy for our Facebook friends. Just go to the Facebook page and there's a link there. Or go to melon-thomas.com, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And that way you can read more about my story if you want to or other things that I've uh, been involved in. I'm, You know, I, I was given the gift of invention because um, I... I from my first experience, conversation with the light, I, I understood that reincarnation is more real than people imagine. There's a physics to it. There's a quantum physics to it, and that I would be returning. And so I asked the light, is there if there was anything I could bring back that was tangible? And I was. Uh, it evolved into me uh, being given the gift of invention. And I've been a full-time inventor since my near-death experience, and I've invented. Um, Everything from shoes to toys to mainly a lot of uh, medical devices and regeneration devices involving things like phototherapy. And um, in my uh, in my seminars, I show people I there, there's I I've had inventions. My technologies are in like 15 countries. And um, uh, one of my one of my one of my biggest interests which the light has helped me with, is I've always had an interest since I was a child. Maybe it's because of being in Catholic boarding school and being told I'm going to go to hell for eternity every day. Hmm. Um, I started, started thinking about, you know, what is eternity and what is life at an early age? And one of the earliest questions I ever had was, why do we grow old and die? And I have, uh, uh, I thought I was going to grow up and be a doctor and study that. And since my near-death experience, I've been able to be a full-time researcher in this field. And the light has given me many uh, inventions and technologies that have been very effective on everything from wound healing to anti-aging to oncological support, 
post-surgical applications, and dentistry, in fact. Dentistry, eh? Mm-hmm. Oh, dentistry yeah. is very important because your teeth and, and animals and humans, dental has been the number one health problem of animals and humans from the beginning of time. Your teeth will be your biggest health problem of your life if you don't take care of it, and they will shorten your life and make your life miserable. So I mean, dentistry, aside from being able to eat, they, there's also a lot of like heart damage that's related to um, health, oral health damage, right? Absolutely. And the other thing about uh, longevity, which is really my specialty, quality of life and longevity is that as we age, we hit a certain age, say in our 50s, where our body, no matter how many, how many vitamins you're taking, our body starts to demineralize. And so your body tends to break down in a logical way. Your body has got great millions of years of, evolu- of uh, evolutionary wisdom in it. Your body will start leaching minerals from your jawbone first than your spine or your legs. And so this is why at about 50 on, people start experiencing periodontal disease. You know, the, um, the teeth get loose, the gums get infected, and that is some of the most um, uh, health-offending bacterias that you can ever have in your body, and you swallow them constantly if you don't take care of your teeth. And so um, in, in my first work in longevity studies, I got very interested in dentistry and applications and working with some very famous dentists to come up with dental um, uh, technologies that would help people regenerate bone in their mouth and uh, address periodontal disease. Oh, that's interesting. What's your latest invention? Uh, I, 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 the, the string of inventions have been, I'm a very eclectic inventor. I, I've been given the gift of invention. I invent every day. I have notebooks and notebooks and drawers full of inventions. And I realize that maybe of only a fraction of my inventions will get out in my lifetime. But you know what? I love the flow. I love the activity of inventing. And so as a, as an inventor, you have to be very practical because each invention is going to take a couple of years of your life if you're lucky, uh, maybe longer. So, uh, I keep coming back to regeneration technologies, phototherapy, um, and that sort of thing. And so, uh, most of my inventions, including my latest, are ways to get, uh, phototherapy and uh, these kind of products to the general public at an affordable price. And next year, I'll be coming out with something that the public can afford because up till now, the uh, the 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 uh, use of uh, this light to regenerate, and we're talking not new age stuff, this is medical stuff, uh, the, the cost of these technologies have been anywhere from, from $20,000 to $100,000 from corporations that have built these things. Mm-hmm. And my goal next year is to come out with a system you can have at home that you can afford for maybe five, $600 that will do everything the $100,000 equipment did. Because once you understand the regenerative power of certain wavelengths of light, and this is not new age at all, this is tissue optics and, and quantum physics, um, then the best use of this light technology is to use it every day because basically speaking, uh, we're in the field of quantum biology now, and that's looking at your biology, looking at your atoms as your biology. Mm-hmm. And at the nuclear level, uh, you live on light. All the food, everything you take in, the, 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 the body is always trying to extract at the end of the cycle ATP or electrons. And so we, we imagine this, we, we come from the light, we're all about light while we live, and then when we die, we return to the light to be regenerated again. <laughs> it's, it's all about light, it really is. And human beings, to a quantum biologist, is a wet cell battery. And we tend to lose our charge as we get older, and that increases entropy, or what you might call aging. And so what if you could recharge your battery every day, especially for people over 40 or 50? Uh, because when you're young, you know, you can handle anything. You think you're going to live forever. But, um, but what if we could extend the quality of life much longer than, than you imagine? That's what I'm about. Cool. Well, getting back to the, the, the near-death experience, when you ask to see the full creation beyond the human illusion, you uh, apparently zoomed out past the solar system and reported hearing and feeling a sort of sonic boom. And in fact, at each stage of the experience, you moved out beyond not just you know from the solar system to the galactic, but you know you, you kept going 
level to level, and at each point you report these sonic booms. D- did these booms seem to correlate to something? Uh, other than, in other words, were they attached to moving up or down a fractal level? Well, um, I, I can talk about it now because I understand things so much better now. See, I've, I've had the um, uh, ability to go back to the light every day and get get. Uh, um, um, that's my cell phone going off. I'll try to quiet uh-huh. it. That's, but that's very I, nice. I've had the ability to um, go back to the light every day and get clarification. So now I can really explain what that was all about that I couldn't before. And um, um, uh, so I can tell you that uh, those booms I, I, I was hearing was actually chakras opening. Oh. In my chakra system. Because you don't, you don't have to go anywhere to be everywhere. You are already there. It's a, we're very multidimensional beings. And so uh, when I thought, you know, in the early days I wrote about it as I was in the void, I know what that is now. That's dark energy, dark matter. And I predicted back in the 80s that we would be able to image and the great study of cosmology would be about dark energy, dark matter. You know, um, when it comes to... um, when it comes to the universe, did you know that every star, every atom, every physical thing, every planet, everything that is physical in the universe that we know about only amounts to 4% of the universe? Hmm. The yeah, well, there's of, a lot of supposedly empty space out there, yeah. Well, it's not empty. It's, right. it's, uh, we're just beginning to understand what it really is. It's not empty at all. But uh, so... So everything that we we only know we only know about really four percent of the universe, and the rest of it is this incredible realm um, that is actually devoid of experience. So imagine you go into a realm where there is no experience. We're 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 from a realm in, in three, fourth, and fifth dimensional reality where it's all about experience, right? We hear, we see, we taste, we experience. We're psychic. We're all of that. What if you were in a realm and yogis have been there and yogis try to explain it there is a realm that's beyond experience there's no experience so try to put words to that yeah <laughs> yeah now melon karen in our chat room uh is very curious about this light technology that you're talking about mm-hmm. and she was wanting to know if there's a way that she could follow the progress somewhere yeah, uh, just get on my uh, my mailing list on my website, and I will be giving out more and more information about that um, as I move into next year. Uh, I, I have for probably 20 years been involved with large corporations and corporate settings, you know, for funding and backing, and they're only interested in this very high end stuff. And um, but I continue to evolve and get more information from the light, where I've been able to um, in my next issue that I'll be coming out next year, my next issue of technology will be so simple, so affordable, and yet as effective as anything you'd pay $100,000 for. So just get on my my mailing list on my website, and I'm going to start, I will start producing, I'll start showing pictures of these things, I'll I'll start giving out a lot of information about it. Excellent. Good to know. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned as you moved out beyond our solar system, reporting an awareness of other life, and you you assure us that we're not alone. Can you describe for us some of this other life? Um, I did ask that question. Uh, my original experience is there is there other life? Are we alone? And um, I was able to experience in my expansion of consciousness. It's not, it's not like I was sent anywhere. I, I I want people to understand that you can you're already there. You can be any. You are already everywhere if you're in the hologram. Uh-huh. But I can tell you that the universe is full of life, life. But but uh, most of the life in the universe is microbial. By far, just as most of life on planet Earth by far is ninety percent microbial. And did you know that um, that uh, of the trillions of cells in a human body, over ninety percent of that is microbial? Did you know that? Fascinating. Most of the life in the universe is microbial, but if you want, if you're talking about life that we can communicate with, resonate with, exchange information with, get to know, so to speak, for us, I mean, there there are cultures that are a million years ahead of us, a million years behind us, 
there are cultures where we're like dolphins to them, and we can't even really, uh, most of us anyway on the planet, can't even talk to dolphins, can we? (laughs) Some of us wish we could. I know, but but finding life that's somewhere in the range that we're in uh, at our stage of evolution is pretty rare, and I'm talking cosmic terms, of course. Uh Um, Probably life that we could communicate with it's on the same kind of evolution that we are um, probably there may be a, it's a small number but it's maybe 10 billion planets out there <laughs> well, that's a tiny number <laughs> in the universe that's a very small number yeah. but um, uh, and um, I, I really don't believe and um, I know so many of the UFO experts and everything and um, um, some of them are good friends but um, I really believe I, I really don't uh, I'm really suspicious of the true believers and I'm really suspicious of the disbelievers I, I think the truth is always in the middle somewhere and I really believe you know you've heard there's some of the excuses why the the um, uh, extraterrestrials can't help us or try and help us but are hiding behind stuff and it's all that kind of just falls apart for me I really believe that humanity is so resilient that and I and I and I would really and, and forgive me for saying this if it rubs people some wrong way, but in all my looking into all of this, I really haven't, and I've seen some wild things on this planet, I've, and I, I believe our government can do anything that a UFO can do. I mean, let's face it, um, if you've seen a picture of it, it's obsolete. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. I I know we have crafts that can mem- that do what people think are UFOs. I know that. So that's not really alien to me. I really haven't seen what I would consider really alien thoughts. And that's the interesting thing. A lot of these thoughts that come through the channelers to me are not alien at all. They're uh, I mean, come on. But um, but I believe that humanity is so resilient that if extraterrestrials landed tomorrow and made themselves known, which I think they would. Um, that we would be so we would assimilate them so well we would have them in TV commercials in two weeks <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how that's how we would absorb them but and so um, and so I'm I'm actually looking for more evidence on a practical level I can go to the light and get inventions why can't people actually go to an extraterrestrial and get an invention I haven't seen one yet that I think is a is an extraterrestrial invention so I'm I'm a more practical kind of guy and I don't mean to you know rub anybody the wrong way who who you know like to live in all that conspiracy and other other paranoia kind of things but um, I really believe I'd like to see more evidence of something really practical and I don't believe um, aliens are cooperating with the government there's no need for that if you can transcend time and space do you know what I mean I hear you. Um, and and again I really don't want to rub anybody the wrong way but I have some dear friends that are you know, masters of the of the extraterrestrial genre, and uh, recently when I was in Chicago, um, I had a dear friend who's one of the big guys in all this kind of try to go over with me again that there's all these markers around planet Earth for the UFOs, right, to recognize and landing spots and this, that, and the other, and the serpent mounds in Ohio and the pyramids and all that. And I, I just had one question for him. And it kind of caught him off guard. I said, you mean they can transcend time and space and they don't have GPS? <laughs> they, they, why would they need that stuff? Yeah, I, I feel you there. You know, yeah. But I'm not putting anybody down. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm just saying I look for a little more. You know, just some logic. And I just look for a little more. <laughs> You know, I believe uh, I was shown that we will have open uh, we will have open contact with extraterrestrials in in our genre, the ones that we can communicate with, mm-hmm. because they're looking for us too, um, and we are sort of finding each other out there. I believe I was shown that within 400 years we will have emissaries with other planets. And of course, when you when you exchange uh, cultures and technologies, uh, we suddenly are way beyond having to have wars or mm-hmm. need or greed or any of that stuff. Um, it's it's like um, you know uh, it's like if somebody showed up with Christopher Columbus and gave him a computer. You know what I mean? Yeah. What would he do with it? It's incredible what what how how fast once you start exchanging emissaries and cultures, 
uh, how fast you, you just take quantum leaps in where you were. And I, and I think humans are prepared for that. I think we could do that any day of the week and give us a chance, you know. Cool. Well, Melon, we have just about five minutes left here. Um, Karen has called in. I, she's got a question for you. Karen, quick question for Melon, Thomas Benedict. Hi there. Oh, hi. Yes. Um, I wish I would have known you were going to be on the show. I would have been, been here for the whole thing um, because I've followed you in the past. And one of the things when I was looking at some of your work and some of the things that you were writing, um, I was also looking at Nassim Karameen at the same time. And one of the things that you got, which was a tetrahedron, I don't know the whole geometrical name for that, but um, was the exact same thing that he came up with. And I was curious. I did actually email you and, and didn't hear back. I'm sure it was one of the thousands you got, you know. But um, I was just curious if you ever had noticed the, the likeness of that to his work. Well, I'm, I'm aware of his work. In fact, um, he lived in the same town I did back in 97. Um, but the, the difference is, is that um, when you're talking about this zero point and this quantum flux and all of that, um, I believe free energy is within a couple of years now. You'll be able to buy it for about $5,000. I, I know companies that are coming out with it. Uh, I know no conspiracy can hold back the Chinese or anybody else. I predicted back in the 80s that um, free energy as we know it, of course, you know, there is no such thing as free energy, but there's almost free energy. I predicted that what we, what we call free energy would be invented in uh, America, but the Chinese would end up selling it to us because you can't hold them back. But what, here's what's interesting about all the zero point and all that super sophisticated stuff is, is that I don't need to run a solar system or a galaxy. I just need to light the lights in my house. Yeah. And that, that kind of almost free energy is right around the corner. In fact, Google's investing in it. So many companies are about to bring that out. It'll be like an, a little, uh, about the size of an air conditioner. Um, so the good news is that this is all just around the corner, you know, three to five years. Uh, mm. Some people can buy this stuff now. But um, I'm looking for the kind of free energy that's going to uh, make electric cars operate and light my house. I don't need right. to actually run a solar system. Well, so there's, there's Karen, a bit of a difference there. That answer your question, Karen? Well, actually, it was more of the theoretical part of the tetrahedron that, you know, he talked about originally in his first um, uh, video. Um, I think he's moved beyond that and is into some other kinds of things. But I appreciate knowing that, and I wish it was more uh, sooner than three to five years. Yeah, it's right around the corner, and I, I love all that exotic stuff, but again, I keep coming back to what's practical for now. And um, Well, and that's I going to make that. such a huge difference for everyone on Earth. Uh, well, the and, future and, is electric. The future is all electric, and one of the things that we can do in the West is, uh, once we, when we have this stuff, is give it to the poor people in the Amazon jungles and the forests who are cutting down the forests just to live and burn it into charcoal to make money, we can afford to give these people these free energy devices and hot plates. And we can, st well, one thing we need to do in the West is to do whatever it takes to stop the rainforests uh, from being uh, depleted by poor people who need to live. And this yeah. is where this kind of energy is. And also, I'll tell you, anti-gravity is what, anti-gravity is a misnomer, but it's a, it's a good word. Anti-gravity is around the corner. And the first, I see the first use for anti-gravity is just moving things around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, well, what if your packages didn't weigh anything to ship? <laughs> no, well, and what if we didn't have car accidents, and what if we didn't need roads? And, and Well, you know, the state of California, where I live, uh, they just passed a law, the governor just signed it, where you're, able, you're going to be able to have these cars that drive themselves on the road now. Hmm. Yeah, pretty pretty cool, huh? This stuff's coming on pretty fast, and uh, we're living in a in a miracle age. I mean, uh, we're living in a time in which our ancestors could not even have begun to imagine. Well, Melon, thank you so much for being with us. Just a few more seconds here, so I want to uh, implore people go check out melon dash melon dash thomas dot com. Uh, check out the CD DVD set and uh, get on that mailing list to find out what's coming down the pipe with him. Uh, thanks again for for being with us. I have other questions, but uh, I'm afraid that we've pretty much run out of time. Maybe some other time. 
Sure, I'd be glad to. Let's have some more shows. Uh, this is fun. You're a very good interviewer. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and, and, you know, to, these are things that I'm passionate about, and uh, near-death experience was the beginning of my own personal uh, you know, research into finding out what is real when I fell from my own religious, you know, had my own religious fall from grace uh, 20-some years ago now. So uh, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, your experience is one that has continue to give to everyone around the world and so uh we thank you and uh and bless your work well thank you and blessings to everyone out there believe me the world is better than people even imagine and we just need to open our eyes to that it sounds like a perfect last thought we will uh we'll catch up with you later sometime Ellen. thank you very much sure all right well that's it for us facebook.com slash extraordinary year uh go like us you can follow me on twitter at tim bravo and it's 44 days until december 21st uh not sure if that's going to make a difference or not but uh we will definitely have uh an exciting next month and a half between now and then keep your ear to the ground hold on tight and do not be afraid it's an extraordinary year peace is on its way namaste Log Talk Radio. Warning, the following program may include profane language, controversial viewpoints, and perspectives on the true nature of reality so far removed from the status quo, they'll make your head spin like a top. Young children, corporate executives, and religious fundamentalists should turn away now. Konnichiwa, planet Earth. Welcome to Extraordinary Year. My name is Tim Bravo, and I thank you for joining us tonight. T-minus 144 days until December 21st, 2012. Our guest tonight died of brain cancer in 1982. No, we're not doing another interview from the grave like we did with Michael Talbot, but we will be speaking with someone whose experience afforded him a perspective from which to explain the holographic nature of the universe. Melon Thomas Benedict is one of the most well-known near-death experiencers alive, and yes, he is alive, although to call him a near-death experiencer may not exactly be accurate because he actually did die and was dead. In fact, he not had he not interrupted what open minds have come to understand as the standard death experience, he may well have just moved on into the light and we would be stuck talking about the election tonight like everyone else. He did do something that interrupted the process. Because of that, he's here with us tonight to regale us with this most intricate exploration of the dying process and the true nature of humanity's existence, the true nature of our planet, the true nature of all creation. So detailed, in fact, that our beloved Deepak Chopra refers to him as an encyclopedia of the afterlife. Now, I've asked him onto the program tonight because in Mellon, we are blessed to have a brother who's seen not just the far reaches of the cosmos, but our own future. And he says that future is good. Over the course of this extraordinary year, 2012, I, my frequent co-host, Canada and Matt, our guests, and you, the listeners, have examined so many aspects, so many timelines, so many conspiracies, indications, positive and negative. Tonight, I want to explore Mellon's experiences with you, in order to reignite our collective hope for tomorrow. Now, I dare guess that at the end of this show, we'll all be feeling a bit more positivity, a bit more hope. Melon Thomas Benedict, thank you for joining us and helping to enlighten us at a time when many of us just might need it. Well, thanks, Dan. It's a, a pleasure to be on your show, and um, uh, I'm, I'm here to tell people there's a concern that may be able to answer all questions. I've had a lot of questions, so... Huh. As far as they know, I'm the only near-deather that uh, believed and, and treated this as an interactive experience and actually had a great conversation with the light. Now, we all, when we all go to that light, and we all will, <clears throat> whether you have a near-death experience or an actual death, um, we, we'll, we will all find ourselves in front of that source. 
And I, I have to tell you that that source light begins in your heart, in your heart of hearts. That's where the light begins. That's where that tunnel of light that they talk about begins. And it connects you with the source. You are always, always connected to that source, no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, no matter what you've done, no matter if you believe there is no source, no matter if you believe some voodoo doctor disconnected you from it, you can never be disconnected from the source. And that source knows you intimately. It will speak to you in whatever dogma you're stuck in, whatever religion you think you believe in, whatever your family upbringing, whatever your language, the source knows you. And so it will, if you, if you have a conversation with it, it will, it will speak to you in your language, so to speak. So if you're Christian, it will give you a Christian experience. If you're Muslim, you will have a Muslim experience. If you're Jewish, you will have a Jewish experience, and, and on and on. I had no particular belief in anything, certainly any kind of religious deities. I certainly thought that was silly. But oddly enough for me, when I asked the light uh, these questions, um, are you God, um, the light, uh, the first thing I saw was, um, you know, Jesus, which was my earliest reckonings of what a deity might be. Mm -hmm. And... As far as, uh, as far as the researchers know, I'm the only one that asked. I, I was seeing Jesus. I could feel the energy, the Christ energy, the Christ uh, complex. And it is real. The Christ energy, the Christ aspect in all of us is real. But I asked the light, what, did, what does this mean? Like, pull the curtain? I know I'm seeing this, but what does this really mean? And that's when... Uh, my conversation with the light took on a very interesting aspect in that every time the light showed me something, I asked to show me what that was, or what that was really about, what that was revealing. And it turned out um, to be a very, very interesting and uh, long conversation and uh, changed my life. It's shown us, both from prophecy and, and scientific experts, that they're they're quite often wrong. I mean, even Einstein was wrong about the uh, expanding universe. He was completely wrong about that. But uh, but I believe them. I believe the experts of our time. And for me, what happened was I saw a photograph, and and I and I, and I understood this after I uh, in my near death experience when I had a life review. I saw a photograph that gave me the seeds of my disease, and that was a photograph. Uh, collage that a group, had, uh, a well-meaning group, had put together of the city of Los Angeles from the air, an aerial photograph of the city of Los Angeles, and right next to it, it was comparing it to a micro photograph of a cancer cell, and they looked very similar, almost exact. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, in my heart of hearts, and I didn't realize it at the time; it took um, many years later uh, for me to actually understand it. At that moment, I had the thought in my heart of hearts that nature had gone wrong and created a malignant cancer on planet Earth called humanity. And uh, being a human and believing in my heart of hearts that humans were cancers on planet Earth, that the Earth had a cancer called humanity, <clears throat> guess what I developed uh, years later? I developed brain cancer. And uh, so uh, completely clueless. I was a self-employed artist at the time. No, uh, no health insurance. It's still an issue today, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I pretty much fell through the cracks of um, uh, after getting diagnosed, and um, I was told it was inoperable, incurable, given six to eight months to live at the time. And I'm one of those people that literally fell through the cracks, and there are many of them uh, that actually get uh, these kind of diagnoses of serious medical conditions or terminal illnesses that walk away, and you never hear from them again. You don't know if they lived or died. You don't know. Well, I'm one of those. I'm one of the lost ones who fell through the crack to come back and tell you that um, I, survived, I survived a terminal illness, and I survived death itself. Um, for me... Uh, I succumbed to my, I believe I succumbed to my disease while in hospice care and uh, had, a, had a living will uh, asking not to be resuscitated uh, in any way whatsoever. In fact, I wanted them to leave my body alone for six hours to make sure I was dead because I was someone who really believed the world was going to end in my lifetime, not from any religious prophecy or anything, just from what I was seeing on television, what I was believing from the newscast. 
And what I was believing from uh, these uh, well-meaning ecology groups, which were spreading a lot of disinformation at the time, that I, I, I thought was the truth. So uh, basically, um, I, I, I had this thing that we call a near-death experience. I didn't even know that was what I had until um, uh, several years later after my near-death experience, which took place in uh, 1982. I had met a woman named uh, PMH Atwater, who is one of the leading researchers and writers in the field. I attended one of her lectures, and I, I said to myself, I think that's kind of what happened to me. And so um, I, I got to know her after that lecture. I've been her friend ever since to this day. And she's the one that kind of discovered me in the backwaters of, mm -hmm. uh, of the South where I lived. And she started introducing me to other people like Dr. Ken Ring and other researchers as an interesting case because she, she had interviewed thousands of cases. Dr. Ken Ring had, had, had interviewed at least 10,000 cases near death by that time. And they thought there was something interesting about my case that I, I didn't know because I had nothing to compare it with. I knew no other near deathers. Um, I really didn't even uh, identify with the word. And um, in my case, they were surprised to find out that when I went to what people call the light, and there is a light, there is a light, and the, the light is the source of us all. It's the source where we all come from, we all go to, where we're all regenerated from. There is a source. And uh, when I found myself in front of that source, I was completely surprised. And like, I guess any good atheist, I wasn't even an atheist, so I guess any good non-believer, being very surprised, uh, asked the, just said, are you God? I, I thought I was standing before uh, my traditional uh, conceptions of what I'd learned in Catholic boarding school. And the, uh, uh, I, I realized almost immediately that I was having an interactive experience. And this is what the researchers kind of thought was interesting about my case is that I asked the light if we could talk. I wanted to, I had a lot of questions. And I'm the first near death that they know of that did this. I actually stopped the experience, had a great conversation with the source, the light, and uh, and also um, uh, had an expansion of consciousness in which I thought I was seeing because I was asking. I had a lot of questions to ask the light because if this is the, if this is the source and this is the one person that might be able to answer all your questions or the one or the one saw a completely different uh, story going on in the world than they think is going on. Now, you you have a very intricate, multi-textured, detailed experience, you know, in, in this, this death experience of yours. Um, for the purpose of tonight, can you give us just sort of the bare bones overview of the experience from beginning to end real quickly? Yeah, I'll try to put it in a nutshell, so to speak. Um, basically, I'm someone who um, was um, uh, not even an atheist. I had no spirituality whatsoever. I think atheists at least show some interest. They'll argue with you about the subject of God and eternity and all that sort of thing, which I thought was uh, most of my life was a pointless exercise, like talking about politics. <laughs> yeah. But um, but for me, I, I'm someone that... Um, uh, you know, just um, turned around one day and my whole life flipped upside down. I, I had been experiencing um, uh, blackouts and episodes like that. I went to a series of doctors and was diagnosed with a uh, terminal disease that was inoperable and curable at the time and totally unprepared for it. Uh, I don't know if you can be prepared uh, for a doctor telling you that you're terminal. In fact, um, uh, after the testing and the doctor came in to uh, talk to me, when he said the word terminal, it I did, just didn't even register with me. I, I said, well, what are you saying? You know, what do you mean? And so I was caught completely off guard, completely clueless. Before before my experience, I had uh, I was not in the metaphysics as, as people are today, anything like that. I wasn't interested. I, uh, I also had never heard of hospice till I ended up in one. So talking about being completely clueless, um, uh, there you go. I'm, I'm also someone who, although I didn't have a spiritual background, um, 
per se that I believed in. Of course, I, I'd been raised for a number of years in Catholic boarding school. That may have something to do with <laughs> my not believing in deities at the time. But um, for, for me, I was very much into ecology and science and everything. And, and going even back to the 60s, uh, 1960s, that is, in the past century, um, <laughs> the uh, experts of the time were telling us that uh, no matter what mankind did, uh, it was too late. We couldn't turn. We couldn't turn around our devastation to planet Earth. That we were going to overpopulate planet Earth. That we were going to blow the Earth up. I mean, all those things. You know, that people worry about. Well, I believed it, and uh, I believed all the experts. And you know, as as history has 